All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today we took some additional steps in the direction of governance during a pandemic. Continuity of government is very important, and it means a lot uh, for our city and for our residents. And we did so uh, despite the restrictions in place related to COVID-19. Um, our residents and businesses are looking to their elected leaders to take action and ensure their needs are being met and critical services are being delivered. Our mission as elected leaders and public servants is, in fact, now important now more than ever as our families and communities struggle, sometimes desperately to stay afloat and survive amongst the challenging and unprecedented circumstances created by the crisis. What I believe today is as much as ever that residents want to believe in the legitimacy of their government that the people they elected to represent them are working every day for the common good, and that they have confidence in their government uh, that we can get the job done, even in the midst of great challenge, and there's no challenge that's greater than this pandemic. What we also saw today was two stark differences in that effort. On one side was a vast majority of our city council members who understand the seriousness of this moment and the urgency um, and how we need to be laser focused in supporting our residents and businesses who are desperately in need, who understand, as I do, that we need to act swiftly and boldly to help our fellow Chicagoans who are literally sick and dying and do everything in our power to support our communities uh, who are struggling. However, we also saw the other side of council, made up of a small handful, who decided to use this moment of crisis to grandstand. They stuck out like a sore thumb, choosing to serve themselves instead of the residents who elected them, choosing to put their own selfish interest ahead of their city and their communities. And it is selfish. And it's also shameful. And it is an utter contradiction to the spirit of public service that you see the vast majority of city council members display. And I am personally embarrassed that one of those individuals is the alderman who represents my ward, the 35th. This is exactly what voters voted against just 12 months ago. The politics of elected officials putting their own selfish interests ahead of the people that they serve. People who need leaders to be responsible and steady always, but particularly in times of crisis. What you saw today is exactly the kind of politics I have fought against in my campaign, and I will continue to fight against every single day that I am mayor of this great city. Of course, let's have a robust debate. That's what democracy should be about. But dear Lord, in the middle of a pandemic where every day life and death are hanging in the balance, enough with the selfish political stunts. Our residents deserve better, and I'm never going to stop fighting for them. The reality is that the ploy of these grandstanders changes nothing. It only needlessly delays the business of the city for two days and underscores exactly why we need an emergency order in the first place. Working in partnership with council leadership, particularly Chairman Dow and floor leader Viegas, this ordinance in essence codifies the executive order we enacted last month when we couldn't meet as a deliberate body to ensure a coordinated citywide response to deploy resources and services when they're needed, where they're needed. The ordinance will ensure that we have the ability to draw upon emergency contract services and supplies throughout the duration of this crisis. But, and this is an important qualification, only for a limited amount of time. The powers are not absolute and the ordinance will sunset in June, if not before. As we move forward to address new and ongoing challenges related to COVID-19, we are committed to ensuring full transparency around our emergency response with our colleagues in the council and, of course, with residents. 
will continue to keep people apprised of the emergency decisions through our regular press briefings, as well as through weekly reports, our website, and the myriad ways in which we are interacting with residents and members of the City Council, both formal and informal. That's because despite the unprecedented challenges created by this moment, nothing has changed in regards to our values of transparency in government. That includes today's introduction of the Emergency Relief for Affordable Multiple Family Properties Program, known as ERAMP. As all are aware, the impact of this crisis has shaken the entire economic life of our city, particularly our low-income families. As a result, many owners of affordable housing developments in our city are themselves facing their own challenges, making mortgage payments, putting owner and tenant at risk. To address this, the E-Ramp Ordinance provides $3 million to help stabilize Chicago's affordable housing developments and ensuring our residents continue to have a safe roof over their heads. And I would make one additional note. While our immediate focus continues to be the health and security of our residents from this pandemic, we are aware of the acute needs of renters as well as landlords across the city. And we will continue to find ways at the city level and in partnership with other levels of government to provide relief. Just as we prioritize stimulus and relief programs for those hardest hit from the start of this crisis, we'll be doubling down on our efforts looking for ways to support renters and landlords. As we move forward in this fight against COVID-19, my continued hope is to have as many people at the table as possible, even virtually. Whether we are addressing emergency services for or affordable housing, aid to our small businesses, or access to food and health care. We have to be in this fight together. And I want to thank everyone uh, working together to share their perspectives, insights, and expertise as we solve the challenges facing our city, as well as ready our communities for rebuilding and recovering, and that will follow. This includes elected officials, businesses, community uh, leaders, faith community, and so many others. All of us fundamentally agree on the important issues. However, these issues are complicated, and for them to be truly solved, they need to be dressed in a fulsome way. So finally, and with great pleasure, in addition to our action against COVID-19, the City Council also took historic steps with the appointment of David Brown as the 63rd Superintendent of the Chicago Police Department. This represents a tremendous moment in our city, particularly for those communities that have been plagued with generations of gun violence and distrust of our police. As I've said before, in David Brown, we are not only getting a public servant of the highest order, and we are. We are also getting a man whose values and own lived experience make him ideally suited for the long-term challenges uh, we are wa working to solve. And I am tremendously proud and excited to be working with him in the months and years ahead. And we also welcome um, to the city of Chicago his wife and daughter. And I think you will come to love our city like your own. Superintendent. Uh, please place your left hand on the Bible and raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, David O'Neill Brown. I, David O'Neill Brown. Having been appointed to the office of superintendent of police for the city of Chicago, having been appointed to the Office of Superintendent of Police for the City of Chicago. Do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. Do solemnly swear I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of Illinois. And the Constitution of the State of Illinois. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the Office of Superintendent. I will of faithfully discharge the Office of Superintendent of the Chicago Police Department. According to the best of my abilities. According to the best of my ability. Congratulations. Thank you, Mayor. Well, let me do this. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Superintendent, would you uh, like sure. to share a few words? Yes. I'm extremely honored. I'm extremely humbled. 
And I'm very excited for this great opportunity to lead the Chicago Police Department and the brave men and women of the police department. I am so excited to learn more about the city. Uh, I plan to tour the neighborhoods, uh, interact with people as soon as guidance allows, uh, and I'm really just humbled. And I'm not here for average. The last four days as acting superintendent, I've talked to the command staff about moonshot goals, <laughs> reminding them of how this country raced against the Russians to be the first to land on the moon. Anyone can do average. Chicagoans deserve a moonshot. The lowest murders on record, the lowest numbers of shootings on record, and the highest level of trust and its officers from its residents. Thank you so much for this great opportunity. I'm so excited. Buckle your seat belts. We're <laughs> headed to the moon. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. And at this time, uh, I'm happy to take a question. Welcome back, Dana. Thank you. Good to be back. <laughs> um, Mayor, this one is from me. Um, you, you just a few minutes ago talked about understanding um, that uh, many landlords and renters need relief. With that, what do you think of Alderman Matt Martin's uh, rent abatement proposal or ordinance, which I know wasn't read into record yet, but which many l landlords in particular have concerns about? Mm -hmm. And if you're not in favor, do you have any specific thoughts on helps for on help for both sides? Well, look, you know, it's no secret, and I've said this many times myself, that people all over the city are really facing significant challenges. And if you listen to um, some of the commentary during the public comment uh, period today in city council, a number of landlords um, and related uh, organizations really spoke up. The challenge is the mortgages. The landlords, many of whom maybe own one or two buildings, these are not huge commercial uh, properties that have a huge cash reserve. These are folks who had some liquidity, invested in a building or two, and are now dependent upon that revenue stream uh, from the rent to be able to pay the mortgage, their utilities, the taxes, and all the other things that go with owning a property, which are significant. So. What I've said from the very beginning, of course, we need to help the renters. That's why we stood up a $2 million fund to help both uh, people struggling to meet uh, rent as well as their mortgages. But we need to continue to press at the federal level, the federal government to give relief, and in particular to press the banks um, to give some relief to mortgage holders. Because if we don't do that, and we only solve one part of the equation, we're going to cause undue harm on other people that are also part of this ecostream of mortgage and landowners and renters. Um, okay. So specifically, do you have a position on Alderman Martin's ordinance? Well, I, I, I said the other day that the, I don't think the ordinance um, takes into consideration the other part of the ecosystem, namely, um, the landlords, and I think you heard that loud and clear um, from folks today. We need to solve this, and I'm committed to working with anybody who comes at this with goodwill and understands that you've got to talk about and solve all parts of the problem, not solve one part and then create catastrophe for another part. It, it can't work that way. Okay, thank you. Uh, this question from Marianne Ahern at NBC5. Mm -hmm. New mesh fencing went up around Lincoln Park, some of it already trampled on, but why wall off the park? Well, unfortunately, what we continue to see is some, some folks who are not abiding by the stay-at-home order. We shut down the lakefront now several weeks back because we saw people congregating in mass in ways that we knew weren't safe. As, as Dr. Arwady from Public Health has, I think, really made plain, the fact of the matter is we are moving in the right direction, but only because what we've seen is going from 59% of people staying at home, say in late February, to almost 80% now. And we've got to get that number as high as we possibly can. So the issue isn't going outside. The issue isn't getting exercise. The issue is um, congregating at a place that's attractive, and I get it. It's one of the crown jewels of our city, the lakefront and our parks, but we cannot do it in ways that are not safe. 
and put people at risk. A follow-up to that, it's related from Amy Jacobson at mm -hmm. WIND. Um, she mentions Governor DeSantis of Florida has reopened some beaches with strong restrictions, no gathering in groups, no laying out in the sand, et cetera. Yeah, and look how, look how well that's working. You see the pictures of people, they just flock back to the beaches in mass. I don't know what world that guy's living in, but he's not living in planet reality. So her question is, and I'm assuming I, I know the answer, would you, uh, would you, or at what point would you allow the lakefront to reopen for just walkers and runners and bikers? Well, I think we have made the progress that we've made because of the measures that we put in place. Banning large crowds, stay at home order, and closing the lakefront. Um, and I'm not, I'm committed to making sure that we continue to do what is necessary to bend the curve, which we are doing, but get to a place where we see the number of daily cases decline. And until we see that decline significantly and we see the hospitalizations go down, we see a decline in the number of ICU beds that are occupied by uh, COVID positive or people under an investigation, it is way too soon to talk about opening up anything else in my view. Okay, this uh, question from Dane Placco at Fox. Today is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. What is your assessment of Chicago's environmental health, and do you believe the lower <laughs> carbon emissions we've seen during the pandemic shutdown can be sustained after normal economic activity resumes? You know, it's a very interesting question, and, and happy Earth Day for folks. But um, it's very interesting, and I've been reading um, a lot about how air conditions in some places across the, the world that are normally horrifically polluted are actually seeing um, some of the clearest um, air that they've seen in maybe decades. Um, I, I think this is a moment where we have to learn uh, from the fact that we don't have as many cars on the road, we don't have as uh, many um, uh, uh, vehicles, and that's primarily what it is, although factories, um, but we don't see the kind of things that really add significantly to long-term sustained uh, pollution of our air. Um, that tells us that it's possible. So we've got to be resolved to make sure that pandemic or no, that we do everything possible to try to improve the quality of life. Um, one of the things I want to see happen in Chicago is plant more trees. There are areas of our city that are not green. And you know from when we were kids, um, going back to you know early science days, that the trees are vitally important uh, for um, good air quality. So thinking about this moment and what the lessons are learned, I think are really important. Uh, from Craig Delamore, can you address the point raised by several aldermen in recent days? Meeting virtually is proof that the council can meet and react quickly, so extraordinary authority isn't really needed. Well, uh, here's the problem with that logic, that when we are competing literally on a global basis for every product that we need, whether it's PPE, um, whether it's other products that we need to push out to our healthcare workers, our first responders, we don't have 48 hours. We have maybe hours. And if we don't act quickly, we, are, we lose the opportunity. That is the reality. Now, we've had 24 plus briefings, formal briefings with aldermen since this pandemic really started. And that doesn't count the number of other uh, informal conversations. We've emphasized at every turn how we are doing what we're doing, why we're doing what we're doing, and the, sen and the need for urgency. And the reality is, as you saw yesterday from the budget boat, the vast majority of aldermen understand that. So. We'll see what happens on Friday, but we need to move and we need to move quickly. We need to be able to have the tools to make sure that we are not missing opportunities to really um, put our city in the best possible position to move forward on this pandemic. And as I said, some see this as a moment to grandstand. Others understand the, uh, the, that we are in the moment of our lives, a pandemic, um, a disease that is literally decimating communities. We don't have a moment to waste. I'm going to follow up with my own question. Yesterday on the press call, you said that you didn't want or expect a rubber stamp council. No, that's correct. Today, though, you don't, well, let me, will you reach out to those aldermen who you say are grandstanding to try to discuss their concerns prior to Friday? I can't even tell you the number of conversations that have been had by me and my team um, all across the board to say, okay, explain to me 
what your issue is. How can we address it if it's possible to address it? Some have no interest in doing anything other than trying to take advantage of the moment because they like preening in front of the, the press. Others um, have had some legitimate concerns, which we have addressed, and we've tweaked the language from what we initially um, uh, put forward to really address it's temporary, it's short-lived, it's sunsets, but it's essential. So most people, I think, understand that, but some, it doesn't matter what we explain because the, the, their goal is obstruct, obstruct, obstruct. From Stacey Baca, Channel 7, why not debate the issues in public today, specifically the emergency powers you're seeking as opposed to pushing it off? No, we wanted to debate them, but we saw um, two aldermen um, file a motion to delay. So that was them. That wasn't, I think, the vast majority of the aldermen uh, wanted to do the business of the people and move forward um, in a way so that they can get back to attending to uh, the work of the ward. Unfortunately, because of the actions of a small few, the whole city council was held hostage. We'll come back on Friday and we'll get the work done. From Gregory Pratt, last year the city council banned Chicago aldermen from lobbying state and local government mm -hmm. and vice versa with their counterparts. Mm -hmm. You introduced an ordinance today that would roll that back. What's Not your so. What is your problem with the original ordinance and why roll back reforms that have passed? Um, that's not accurate. And um, the, the, what we heard, there's no going back from banning city uh, council members from lobbying other areas of government. That doesn't change at all. But what we heard through uh, the Board of Ethics is some concern that the original uh, language of the ordinance that was passed last fall swept too broadly and extended to um, elected officials in other jurisdictions that um, were doing um, some business here in the city of Chicago. That wasn't our intent. Um, and so in consultation with the Board of Ethics and others, uh, we are uh, proposing a slight amendment that doesn't um, change uh, what, what the intent of the original uh, ordinance was, which is to make sure that city council members are not lobbying um, uh, other uh, bodies of government. That doesn't change at all. Follow up to what we were just talking about with the, uh, the meeting today and the parliamentary procedure mm -hmm. used from Taman Bradley. Uh, isn't there some truth to what in particular, the 35th Ward Alderman was saying, the council can meet within 48 hours. Why do you need the emergency power you seek? I think I just explained that. We don't have 48 hours when we're trying to get vital services that are necessary to support our health care workers, test, um, and other things that are critically important to making sure that we have the tools that we need uh, to fight this pandemic. We literally, if we, if we wait, we lose. We can't afford to lose. Our residents' lives are on the line, and we've got to move quickly in this pandemic. 48 hours, when we're seeing the level of competition and fighting for basic supplies, is an eternity. You've heard that from elected officials all across the country. This isn't something that's unique to Chicago or Illinois. We are fighting literally uh, and in competition with the world for the basic supplies that we need uh, to support um, our frontline workers um, and other efforts in this pandemic. And then a follow-up from Taman. Um, it's obviously, there's a, well, you call out one of the aldermen, as I just mentioned, the 35th Ward, Alderman, uh, Alderman Ramirez Rosa, saying you're embarrassed. What can you do to stop the acrimony? Well, I think that the people who are using this moment to grandstand need to stand up and be legislators. I have two more questions. Amy Jacobson, again, you've mentioned, as has the governor, that we now expect the COVID-19 peak in mid-May. What data, model, science are you relying on? Well, we're rely relying on the same things we've been talking about for the last six weeks. We're seeing, um, first of all, how frequently uh, the number of cases are doubling. We started out um, in this uh, 12, I'm sorry, every uh, two to three days seeing the doubling of the cases. Um, we're in a very different and better place um, in excess of 12 days um, for the doubling of these cases. That is all to the good, but it's still going up. And so we're still seeing the rise in cases. As I said now many times, we've got to see those numbers start to go down and go down for a sustained period of time. The other thing that we're monitoring is um, ICU beds, the percentage of ICU beds in general, but also the percentage that are being occupied by COVID positive uh, patients or people under investigation uh, for COVID. 
we've got to get widespread um, contact tracing, meaning that, and that's the bread and butter of the public health department anyway, but we've got to build the infrastructure to make sure that when we come out, if somebody tests positive, we're able to very quickly and ably um, do the investigation and then notify other people that that person has come in contact with. That infrastructure is a work in progress, but uh, we're working to get there. And then of course, in general, we have to have widespread testing. No one's gonna feel comfortable until we see a substantial increase in the amount of testing that we're able to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And finally, um, yesterday you, the city announced it's canceled big city mm -hmm. events through the middle of June, but I've had many, many people reach out, so this is kind of a viewer question, mm -hmm. um, and ask what about the Pride Parade? Well, first of all, the Pride Parade is not run by the city of Chicago. For the entirety of its history, uh, it's been run by an independent body. We are in conversation uh, with those folks, um, and we will, um, they will, and, and certainly at our urging, make a determination. But with all of these things, all these large events, we have to be guided by the science and the data, and we cannot reopen and, and have mass congregations. And you know the Pride Parade. It attracts people from really all across the country, certainly um, all across our region, literally millions of people. Uh, we can't congregate in mass until we have reached some of these milestones that I've laid out. Will we get there by the end of June? I can't look into a crystal ball and tell you that, but what I do know is that if we're not there, we can't go forward with any of these mass events until we get to that point. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Mayor, question from Bill Cameron. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you want to proceed with the rest of city council agenda after Lopez and Rosa deferred emergency budget powers? Um, well, it's not that I didn't want to. I wanted to get through the entire schedule, but once a DMP motion um, happens, uh, uh, we have to um, uh, then consider, and there was a motion to for adjournment by Alderman Mitchell, and that, that was the will of the body. Mayor from Kelly Bauer at Block Club. Mm -hmm. We keep hearing from Governor Pritzker that he might institute a mouth covering requirement, but it hasn't happened yet. Are you considering doing that requirement yourself or any other measures for the city? Look, I think that's a topic that's under a lot of discussion and debate. And what I think is this, and, and I think the governor said this as well, in, in, and this is consistent with not only the CDC guidance, but the guidance of our Department of Public Health, in congregate settings, if you cannot safely social distance, you should be wearing a mask. Grocery store. Um, other um, um, other essential places that people are traveling um, these days. You should be wearing a mask, and I think a lot of people are doing that. The challenge is making sure that every member of the public has the same accessibility to some kind of face covering, and we know from the disparities in our city that that is not so. What is possible in Lincoln Park is not the same as what's possible in Austin or Inglewood or Roseland. So we have to have a policy that is consistent with the realities of people's lives. And while we are gonna to continue to encourage uh, people to wear masks in congregate settings, mandating that without giving people the tools to actually comply, and we're not gonna lock people up because they're not wearing masks um, in, um, in, in public. So, these are nuanced issues. Sounds like a great idea, but when you think about the practicalities of how that's actually gonna be implemented, that's where the challenge comes in. And I don't believe in person placing any further burden on people. They should be safe, they should wear a mask um, when they go outside, particularly if they're going into um, any kind of congregate setting, but I wanna do that in a way that reflects the realities of people's experiences out in the public. Question from Fran Spielman at the Sun-Times. Mm -hmm. Mayor, you introduced an ordinance at today's city council <coughs> talking about powers for Aviation Commissioner Jamie Ree with regard to the O'Hare expansion project. What is the purpose of that ordinance and does it have anything to do with the need to modify the agreement because of the hardship and hardship cost on the airlines by the pandemic? Um, so uh, there are two things wrong with that question. Number one, um, the ordinance today isn't about um, airlines, um, and it, um, I, I can't remember now the first part of the question. This, was, this is an ordinance that's specifically geared towards renewing contracts with concessionaires 
who absolutely has suffered a great hardship because of the declination um, in airline travel. So that's what this is about. Um, I want to make sure that there's robust transparency and discussion and debate around that. But it's about concessionaires. It's not about airlines. Oh, and it's not about the O'Hare modernization project. That was the first part of the question. That's, that's not accurate. Follow-up question from Fran. Mayor, you are delivering the commencement address at Northwestern, yes. Fran's alma mater. What will your message be to the students during these troubled times? Well, um, it's uh, in mid-June, so I haven't written the speech yet. But I, I would expect that I will talk about the fact of the challenges, but also the opportunity that I think are facing um, the young men and women who are going to be graduating um, from Northwestern. It, for me, it's a great honor uh, to be asked to deliver this commencement address, um, particularly given that my, uh, my own alma mater is a different one. Um, but Northwestern is very important um, to our city and to our region. Um, it's a great research uh, institution, um, great faculty. I love their president. Um, and I was incredibly humbled uh, when he asked me uh, to be the commencement uh, speaker. And so I am thinking a lot about um, my message to the students who are graduating um, into a world that's probably very different than they entered uh, when they started as freshmen. So I will reflect upon that, I, I would expect. Question from WBZ. Do you anticipate that you have the votes to pass your executive powers ordinance? Time will tell. Question from Mariano at Univision. Now that the number of Latino victims of COVID-19 is incrementing to numbers that exceed the demographics, will there be any plan to help the community in particular? Yes, we have to. Um, when we announced the uh, racial equity data a little over two weeks ago, one of the things that we pointed out at that time is that we feared there was an underreporting of how this uh, disease was impacting uh, members of the Latinx community. And as we're getting better reporting, meaning that providers are providing us uh, with the uh, racial um, and ethnic demographic data, we are seeing that fear manifest itself. So just as uh, we have been very aggressive in addressing uh, the disparities in the African-American community, which are still profound, we are also going to be working in, in a certain uh, same kind of urgent way um, to get um, and connect up with the Latinx community so we can bring resources, help educate uh, the community, and provide them with the supports that they need to be able to fight this disease. Question from the Hyde Park Herald. Mm -hmm. Alderman Jeanette Taylor says her opposition to the ordinance comes from inadequate sitting funding for coronavirus testing on the south and west sides, as well as inadequate financial support for local small business. Can you describe the city's current and planned actions in these areas? So I'm assuming that the question relates to the uh, budget um, uh, ordinance. Well, first of all, um, she, he provides specificity. It's around the emergency powers ordinance. Yeah, um, the, the budget ordinance. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, first of all, um, unfortunately, uh, which is um, uh, unfortunately, uh, Alderman Taylor's premise is not correct. Uh, and again, through 24 plus formal briefings over the last few weeks, I would hope that a couple things were clear. Number one, weeks ago, we announced a $100 million fund um, to support small businesses across the city. And unlike um, what we've seen at the federal level, our fund still has money um, and still is available for small business owners. We are filling a niche that isn't going to be covered by the federal government. And by that, I mean two things. Number one, what we've found is many small businesses here in the city of Chicago are what we call unbanked, meaning they don't have a long-standing relationship with um, a banking institution where loans or line of credit or so forth. So when you're operating on a cash business or you only have a, a tangential relationship with the bank, you're not gonna qualify for those SBA loans. So that's why our Small Business Resiliency Fund is so important. And another important aspect of it is we provide um, funding uh, for small businesses regardless of the citizenship status of the owner. Federal government, if you're undocumented, you 
cannot get access uh, to these federal funds. That's why we codified an executive order that we will not discriminate against our residents ever, but particularly in this time of need, solely on the basis of citizenship status. Um, so that's really an important distinction. So that fund was announced um, back in March. It's active. We've pushed out um, well over 100 loans so far and, and more to come. So um, I hope that Alderman Taylor um, understands that that resource is actually available to small businesses. Regarding testing, what I can say, and again, this is information that we have shared with uh, the Alderman. It's up on our website, chicago.gov forward slash coronavirus. What we actually see is substantial um, amount of testing in black Chicago. Um, now, there's a lot of reasons for that, but the city certainly isn't um, sitting on its hands. Every single day, myself and or Dr. Arwadi, our public health commissioner, talk extensively about the need for testing. And we are leaving no stone unturned to expand the amount of testing uh, that's available in the city. And if you look at where we started to where we are now, we've increased the amount of testing exponentially, but we still know we've got a lot more to do. And it's not um, for the city to control it. It's not like we've got a, a stockpile of tests and we're not using them. We are trying to get the test here in um, Chicago so we can expand the footprint of people who are getting access to testing. And testing is one of the milestones that I said that we have to reach widespread testing before we can safely come out of where we are now with the restrictions on uh, people's movements. Question, follow-up question from Heather Sharon on the ethics ordinance. Mm -hmm. Why wasn't ethics committee chair Alderwoman Michelle Smith consulted for the proposal? I don't think that that's accurate. And last question from A.D. Quig at Cranes. And, and by the way, oh, you're talking about Michelle Smith. I don't mm -hmm. think that's accurate, but I, I heard Michelle Harris. Um, but I don't think that's accurate either. Last question from A.D. Quig at Cranes. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says he favors allowing states to declare bankruptcy instead of giving them a federal bailout. He singled out Illinois as giving too much to public employee unions and that he was reluctant to give states and local governments additional assistance. What's your reaction and what would be the impact of state bankruptcy here? Well, first of all, we're not going into bankruptcy. And Mitch McConnell, same uh, talking points, different day. It's what we've come to expect from a person who doesn't have a sense of urgency, who doesn't care about anything other than a crass political agenda. Same old, same old from him. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.